Welcome to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. On this podcast, we journey through the devastating experience of the death of a child. Grief is seldom discussed openly in our culture, and the death of a child makes people feel even more uncomfortable. We approach the topic openly and honestly, speaking to people who have lost loved ones and experts who help care for them. Whether you are a parent experiencing loss or someone who wants to support another going through this tragedy, this podcast strives to offer hope and help. Welcome to episode 84 of Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. I'm Marcy Larson, Andy's mom. In today's episode, I get to speak with Velvet, Ivan's mom. Velvet had to grieve in a very public way when her son Ivan's death made national news. So we talk about what that was like and really the beauty of forgiveness. Her story is so compelling. Please enjoy Ivan's mom. so much velvet for agreeing to come on the always andy's mom podcast i am looking forward to talking thank you thank you for having me and thank you for letting me share his story i've been wanting to find a little bit more of a bigger platform to share his story so i'm really looking forward to it yeah why don't you start out by telling us about your son ivan ivan was born in December of 98 Mm -hmm. and he is my first and he just was so good and they're like well don't get used to having such a good baby because the next one might not be that good Uh but just from the get-go he was just so good and then 19 months later, my daughter came along. Oh, wow. And and they were right. She was more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. But again, in true Ivan fashion, he stepped up and was helpful with bringing diapers and all that. And then in another 19 months, a son, another son came along. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) You were busy. Yes. (laughs) So we stopped there. I bet you did. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I did I did the two year plan. That's what I was to call my kids where every two years I had a kid. Yeah, you're on the one and a half year plan. And that there's a huge difference between the two year plan and the one and a half year plan, I think. <laughs> yeah, as a pediatrician, my husband will tell you that my least favorite checkups are the fifteen and eighteen month olds because they all kind of hate me and <laughs> And are having problems. And by that time they're two, they're so much more chill and they (laughs) like me and they think it's fun to to come to the doctor. But 15 and 18 months are tough. So that's what you did is you like had the very toughest age and then decided to be a new mama every time. Like, wow, that's really brave. (laughs) You know, all of those younger years were a challenge. But now looking back on it, I wouldn't do it any different because they were all so close. They all kind of had like the same friend group and the same interests. Most of the time that was good. Sometimes the whole friend group thing was a little bit challenging, but he was always the proverbial big brother, stepped up to the plate, Mm -hmm. always helped, was kind of the leader all through elementary school. I I would have different teachers tell me if they could all be like him, my job would be so much easier. (laughs) He just did his work. They would ask him to help other students. And that was just kind of his nature always. Very easygoing. His dad and I used to joke that he was kind of that all-American kid. The boys wanted to be him and the girls wanted to be with him. Mm Everybody just kind of flocked to him. He definitely had his achievement, not only in school, but in sports. Sports was his absolute passion. We started out at the ripe old age of six years old playing tackle football. Oh my gosh. (laughs) He kind of found his niche being the quarterback. We played basketball Mm -hmm. and was great at all of them. And then he got into high school. And here there's a kind of well-known high school called Brophy, and it's an all-boys school, and they have a very good football program. 
Mm-hmm. And you're so, in Arizona, right? Yes, Arizona in Phoenix. He went out for freshman football and being at such a kind of high level sports, yeah. freshman football was about where he stopped. So his niche was numbers. So he was sports trivia all the way. Yeah. I mean, just stats on everything, football, baseball, basketball, you name it. I mean, I would have conversations with grown men and they would say, man, I don't know any grown men that know stats, especially the old stuff, uh-huh. older stats as good as he does. I was like, well, I knew he knew him well, but I guess not that well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. You're just like, well, that's just Ivan. That's just what he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, he did phenomenal in high school. It's a college prep, so it's a little bit more accelerated. Yeah. Did super well, made his kind of core friend group that he had till the day we lost him. And and still now, many of them reach out to me. So I'm very thankful that he was able to go there and do so well. He was able to get a four-year full-ride scholarship to Arizona State. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. So, of course, we were over the moon happy that he was awarded with that. Ever since he was little, he was, their mascot is the Sun Devils. Mm -hmm. So he was a Sun Devils fan from when he was little. And so it was just kind of he was destined to be that. Oh, fun. So got into Arizona State and his degree that he picked was business sports media. Okay. I wondered if it would have to do with sports. Yep. So right up his alley, many of his roommates and stuff in the dorm were boys that he had gone to high school with. Oh, wow. Okay. That's cool. So I used to tease him and say it was just like high school point two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, was doing great there freshman year. And then many of them wanted to start rushing for fraternities. He did the whole rush thing. And at first I was really trying to discourage him from it mm-hmm. because, you know, I just wanted him to really focus on college and keeping that scholarship that he so well earned. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of went back and forth about that. And then he finally came to me and he said, well, the fraternity that I think I'm going to bid for, they actually require a, you to carry a 3.5 GPA. And my scholarship only requires a 3.0. Because then you thought, well, these are going to be an academic group of guys, right? That aren't going to be just focused on being there for the party. and Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, again, in true Ivan fashion, putting all of his numbers and his forte of getting along with everyone, he convinced me. And I was just like, well, okay, just be safe. You know, and at this point, he's over 18, so it's kind of hard. So he got into the fraternity and absolutely loved it. Sometimes I would try to call him and he would be busy doing an event or this event or whatever. And then just really became intertwined with the fraternity, made a lot of new friends because there obviously were fraternity members that weren't, many of of his high school friends were in this one, but there were others that weren't. So that was also good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They all loved him. Yeah. (laughs) Do you want to go ahead and talk about then what happened to Ivan? Sure. So at the time, I wasn't living here in Phoenix. I was living in Arkansas for the past four years. It was November 11th, 2019, Mm -hmm. Veterans Day. And I had gone to work. It was a normal work day. I got home and... The, they were saying that we were expecting the first ice storm of the year, which if you live in the South and you know an ice storm's coming, it's really kind of a big deal because everything comes to a standstill because the ice storms are just mm-hmm. paralyzing. Mm-hmm. So I got home, I let the dogs out and I lived on a couple acres. So I was outside and was kind of letting the dogs run around before we were all needing to get in and be Mm -hmm. safe. 
So I came in and I noticed a missed call from my ex-husband, which was kind of odd because we really don't speak that often. Uh huh. And then I noticed two missed calls from my youngest son. Because he's still out in Arizona? My youngest son goes to ASU now. Okay, okay, okay. Was he and there at the time too? Yes, mm -hmm. everyone was here in Arizona. My daughter goes south to U of A in Tucson. Okay. And at the time she was a sophomore in college mm -hmm. and the youngest was a senior in high school. Okay. Here, everyone was here and I was there. I immediately call his dad and he picks up the phone and he's just wailing, I guess would be, I, I can't even hardly describe the sound. Yeah. Like I obviously knew something was bad and I don't know why. I just knew it was Ivan. Wow. It could have been Gabby also, right. but right. I just, I just knew it was Ivan. And I just kept saying, what is it? Tell me. And he was just wailing and screaming. And I, I said, please just calm down for a minute to tell me because this is scaring me. Mm -hmm. Finally, he got out. It's Ivan. It's bad. It's mm -hmm. Ivan. It's bad. He just kept repeating that. And I said, what? The first thing that came to mind was a car accident. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I remember him putting the phone down and just screaming. He had put the phone down and my younger son picked up the phone and I said, Sam, can you please tell me what's going on? And he said, hang on, my phone is ringing. So my husband's phone is sitting down now and I'm listening to this and I hear through the phone my youngest son's phone ringing and he puts it on speaker and it's a lady saying, Sam, are you okay? Are you okay? I am so sorry. And at this point, I'm so anxiety ridden and just, right. yeah. I, I can't even think straight. I was screaming in the phone, stop saying you're sorry and tell me what is going on. Yeah. Tell me what is going on. And so all of this is bedlam. His dad finally comes and gets on the phone and just says, it's Ivan. It's really bad. I don't know. Nobody will tell me anything. And I said, who can I call? What's going on? And he says, I don't know. Call Tempe police. I'm just thinking, why is nobody telling me what hospital to call? It's hard. I think people might think, why did you think a hospital and not just automatically jump to the point of he's gone? But I don't think people understand the fact that you just can't for some reason, let yourself go there, that they could really be dead. I don't know. I think it's something in us as parents that we can't let ourselves go to that reality. So there must still be something we can do. So I just wanted to, I totally get that and appreciate that and feel like that's exactly where I went is like, he's going to make it to the hospital, right? We're going to at least get a chance to try. So right. that's why in your mind it was, which hospital is he at? Why is nobody mm -hmm. telling me which hospital he's at? Because in your head, he has to be at a hospital. Exactly. There's no way he's in a morgue. He has to be go to the hospital. You know, and I just kept thinking, well, which, which of his friends could I call to go help him? That was right. kind of my other thing. But eventually when I did find, and this part is still kind of surreal to me, when I did find the, the number... Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if it was the right number. I just right. called Tempe Police Department. I remember a lady answering the phone and me kind of stating who I was. And I said, my ex-husband has called me and said that my son, something has happened there. She knew who I was. Yeah, I know. They know right away. Mm -hmm. Because at first I remember thinking... Okay, just be calm and patient because you're probably going to get transferred several times till they know what you're talking about. But she knew exactly who I was. She said, ma'am, we're going to have an officer reach out to you. Okay. And I said, is he going to reach out to me and tell me where my boy is? And she said, um, 
we're going to have an officer reach out to you. Right now, we have officers on the way to his dad's house. Yeah. And I said, but why? why? Why aren't we going going to him? I hung up with her and I waited probably, I guess, 20 excruciating minutes. I think I tried to call mm-hmm. my sister. My family is in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister and my dad, she didn't answer right away because I think she was at one of her son's games. And I just kept thinking, I don't want to call too many people because I don't want this to turn into a big dramatic thing Mm -hmm. that he just has a broken arm from, but then I kept thinking they aren't going to send an officer to you if he's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was all of these different scenarios. And again, I'm alone and I, you know, don't have maybe a voice of reason there. Sure. Cause you need that. You need people to be there to help you. And you had no one. I just, I don't know what I would have done, honestly. So I, I called back and it was the same lady. And I said, an officer still has not called me. I said, I've got to know what is going on because we are fixing to have an ice storm here and I've got to head out. Yeah. Yeah. And she says, we're trying to make contact. Da, 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 da. At this time I was trying to call a friend, a really good friend who had lived by me, but I think two months prior had moved like three hours North in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. to Northwest Arkansas. And she, so now since the high ice storm is now fully hitting, especially up there, she was like, I would do anything to get to you, but it wouldn't be safe. And I was like, no, don't do that. So eventually a couple people were able to kind of get to me. The officer called me and I'll never forget the words. He asked me to identify myself and I told him, and he said, I regret to inform you that your son Ivan is deceased. Yeah, those are words you just never, ever forget. I no. I will never forget those words either. Just never. They're just ingrained in you. Yeah. And I, I specifically remember saying, Ivan Aguirre. I said, I, can, I remember telling him I can give you his social so you can yeah. make sure if it's the right one. And he said, ma'am, we've made identification. I said, you know, at this point, I think I just said, okay, thanks. So the couple people there were trying to kind of help me get flights, but everything was grounded that night because of the storm. Mm -hmm. So eventually I was able to get a flight out. I think it was 530 the next morning. Mm -hmm. And I had another really good friend there, Jennifer, that only lived maybe like 45 minutes to an hour from me. And she came over. I just remember her literally almost like taking me by the hand and being like, okay, let's let me pack for you. What do you need? I was trying, I remember taking some calls, making some calls, eventually getting a hold of my sister. The next morning, Jennifer got me on the flight. I got here to Phoenix. And I I remember on the flight being like, I just want to sit here and just sob I just want to sob, but none of these people like have any clue what I'm going through. I don't know. I just remember just being like, I just want to sit here and just let it all out. But are they going to kick me off the plane? And I can't be, I can't get kicked off the plane because I got to get to my boy. Mm -hmm. And still at, at, at this point, I had no idea what happened. Right. Right. They wouldn't tell me. I did keep thinking that. Maybe he had a seizure in his sleep Mm -hmm. when he was younger. We had a few years where he kind of bouted with absence seizures. Mm -hmm. And I was like, maybe that's what happened. And I just wanted, just wanted answers. So I got here to Phoenix. I remember getting off the plane and I remember literally walking in circles in the airport because my brain was not functioning to tell me what the next step was that I needed to do. Yeah. Like, I didn't know. I'm like, is, is somebody supposed to be here for me? Where am I supposed to go? And then finally I was like, okay, well, I'll go over here and get a rental car. And I have a several good friends here in Phoenix who all had reached out to me, you know, you can stay here, you can come here. 
So I went to one of my friend's house and he was at work. And I just remember sitting there and being like, I don't know what I do. Right. What do I do next? It's so hard. I, I mean, I couldn't even do my hair. I couldn't do anything. I, I, it, it blows me away that you actually drove a rental car because I can't even imagine being able to do that. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't even know how I did it. I remember, you know, having a couple calls with his dad and them saying that a couple of the moms of the boys that he went to high school with mm-hmm. wanted to reach out and see if they could help me. And I was like, you know, we'll give them their, give them my number. Yeah. And so a couple of them came to help me. And if it weren't for them, I don't know how I would have gotten through everything as far as all of the arrangements that you have to make. Yeah. You really need to rely on other people when it's like this. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And I mean, I had known them, you know, just by seeing them like, you know, at high school functions and different Mm -hmm. things like that, but I didn't know them and to have them reach out and do as much for me as they did. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And then it was about that point that I was having people reach out to me saying, we saw Ivan on the news. And I said, on the news, what what are you talking about? Yeah. Apparently that week there had been, I believe, four deaths in fraternities. I believe one was in Washington, one at San Diego State, Ivan's, and then one maybe in Ohio. And so it was national news and they had gotten a hold of his uh, senior picture and put it up. And then someone else showed me an article and a video clip because I did ask to see it the news was actually outside of his fraternity filming when all the paramedics were there and when they brought him out. And then it was a news story that night and it was the first I ever heard anything. And they said a suspected fentanyl overdose happened at fraternity at ASU. That must have just been shocking to you. completely shocking because I'm like, how are you as the news saying this? And I keep asking and nobody will tell me anything. Yeah. Right. Anything, nothing. In the latter days after that was the planning of the funeral, his funeral, which was, I guess, if you're going to send someone out, I couldn't have asked for it to go better. It was at his high school, which has a beautiful campus, Brophy, and it was in the chapel. And I think the chapel holds about 350 people. And they mm-hmm. said there were well, well over 600 there. And it was just gorgeous. He had 20 pallbearers because he had such a close, close group in high school, 18 of his friends, and then his brother and his cousin. Mm-hmm. And it was just an absolute beautiful funeral. Did that offer you some comfort? That funeral? It did. Yeah. Um, just the outpouring and knowing it was all because of him. They weren't my connections or so many of them knew me personally. It was because of him and the impact that he made. Mm-hmm. I mean, it touched so, so many people and was just loved by so many. I mean, I knew he was a good kid and he was popular, but that was all his doing. That is beautiful to know that your son is so loved by so many. Mm -hmm. It was, that was the biggest comfort. And then I think after the funeral and the reception and all that, then the anger hit real quick. Yeah. Because I wanted to know if it was fentanyl. And that was the other thing is they kept, telling me, well, it's probably going to be months before you know, because there has to be the medical examiner's report as well as the toxicology come out. Mm -hmm. And those take a while. And I said, is there something I can do? Is there like an extra fee I can pay just so I know? And they said, no. It blows me away, actually, that it takes those things take so, so long, right? I mean, I can order a drug test on a kid in the office and we will find out the results in a couple of days. I just never, 
can never understand how these reports seem to take forever, right? And doing toxicology, I don't understand why it takes so long. Yeah. I feel like I need to talk to somebody about that someday because I just, it just doesn't make sense to me. It was excruciating. And I mean, I, I had nothing, you know, and then I would call the, the detective and ask him, okay, I know that it's a, because they kept telling me it's an ongoing investigation. Yeah. It's an ongoing investigation. And I'm like, I get this. Can you just tell me who called 911? No. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me who found him? No. I mean, I would just ask question after question and was constantly shut down. And it, it I just became so frustrated. So then at that point, I kind of became my own investigator and mm -hmm. started asking, started reaching out to kids I didn't even know that I knew that we're in the fraternity and just saying, Hey, I'm Ivan's mom. Please don't think I'm crazy. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just trying to get some answers. Mm -hmm. And then I would hear from some people, well, no matter what you do, it's not going to bring him back. They just don't understand how mom just needs to know. You just need to know what happened. I just, you need to know. I can't say it any other way. That the fact that when your child dies, you need to know why and what happened. And mm -hmm. I don't know why it's this overwhelming need, but it's it's a need. And it's like you can't even consider trying to heal from it until you understand a little more of why it happened and what happened. Right. right. I mean... I had to know because I'm the one, my daughter and I are the ones that went and cleaned out his fraternity room. Mm -hmm. And did anyone talk to you then when you were in there? No, not really. Um, the Dean of Students was there. She was nice, but, you know, still very sterile so to speak mm -hmm. protocol you know we can bring in a counselor I'm cleaning out his dorm room I don't want to talk to a counselor yeah I know you know I'm literally smelling his smell on his clothes and looking at the bed where he died yeah so one of my biggest things was to obviously piece things together and I don't know why this was such an important thing to me. I wanted to know who found him. Mm -hmm. It was just, I guess in my mind, it was kind of like I brought him into this world and saw him first. And I needed to see who saw him last. I don't know why, but it was a, just so finally, like the police wouldn't tell me. So finally, after asking and asking around somebody finally gave me a name mm -hmm. and I said, okay. And this now was probably a month and a half later. Mm -hmm. So I finally got the name to the guy. His name was Joe. And I texted him and told him who I was and, and asked him, I said, I know it's probably hard for you too, but would you be able to speak with me? And he was like, oh, absolutely. And so we had a phone call and I said, can you please? I said, right now, there is nothing further that can hurt me worse. Right. So I need you to be very direct, honest. Mm -hmm. Tell me about everything. That was a good thing to say. I think to just explain nothing you say will make this pain any worse at all. Because right. it is as bad as it can be. Because I mm -hmm. think people are scared to talk to a bereaved mom, especially because like, I don't want to make her feel worse. I'm just going right. to make her feel worse. There is no way possible you can feel worse. You absolutely cannot. So there's nothing that kid could have said to make you feel worse. So that was a good way, I think, to start to make him feel more like, I guess I can just 
tell her. Right. And I, I told him, I said, you know, I don't want you to take this as weird or anything like that, but I feel like we have a special connection now. Mm -hmm. And he, he could not have been a nicer, more polite guy. Mm -hmm. So basically he told me that Ivan was on the third floor is where his room was. And Joe was on the fourth floor. And because this particular day was Veterans Day, they didn't have school and he had kind of a part-time job that he worked. So he was going to work the full day. Mm -hmm. So he got up early and he started coming down the stairs from the fourth floor. And he said, once he hit the third floor and going down the stairs, he kept seeing blood swipes every so often on the wall and was like, what in the heck? And so he kept seeing them. And then he got to almost the first floor and saw what he, he describes as this guy just like laying on the stairs, blood around him, just a complete mess. And he said at first he thought maybe someone that was homeless or somebody like broke into their fraternity house Mm -hmm. and was like passed out. And so he woke him up and he was very incoherent. And he said, after a little bit, he finally made sense. And this kid's name was George. And he said that he was a friend of Ivan's and Joe said he was real shocked. And he was like, okay. He's like, well, you're real messed up. He's like, so I'm going to take you up to Ivan's room. So he took him up there and he's like, you guys can sleep this off. But when you guys wake up, all of that needs to be cleaned up because apparently everybody gets punished if there's like a mess or something in the house. Mm -hmm. So he took him up there and he said, when he went into Ivan's room, he noticed that he was on his bed face down, but not in an awkward way. And this is at like eight o'clock in the morning. And so he just figured he was sleeping. Yeah. He put George in the other bed because Ivan's actual roommate had gone home for the weekend and wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Again, this is on Veterans Day. So there were no classes and all the boys and everybody was like sleeping in and staying in their rooms and all this. So Joe went to work and he said that he came home later that afternoon at like two ish and started walking up the stairs and all the blood swipes were still there. Yeah. And he was like, what in the heck? These guys didn't get up and clean this stuff up. We're all going to be in trouble. So he went back into Ivan's room. And as soon as he walked in, he noticed Ivan was in the same exact position as he was that morning. Mm -hmm. He thought it was weird, but he went over to the other kid first and started trying to wake him up to tell him to go clean up. And he went over to Ivan and as soon as he touched him, he said he was ice cold. And he said that he kind of tried to turn him over, but he knew. Yeah. He knew. And so he said he ran out into the hallway and just started screaming. And guys started just coming out of their rooms. And he called 911. Joe did. And he was trying to give CPR. And and it was just pure bedlam. Yeah. Yeah. And so the paramedics got there the entire time this other kid, George, in the other bed was still incoherent. Yeah. And so they tried like waking George up and George got up and he was in such another state that he eventually was hindering the process of the paramedics trying to work on Ivan. Right. And so he was messing up the scene. Other guys were trying to like get George out of there because there was blood on the scene. They didn't know if there was foul play. Sure. So even though it's ASU police jurisdiction, they had to call in Tempe police because Mm -hmm. of possible foul play. They got there after a while, assessed the scene, realized that the blood came from a cut on George's hand that he had sustained because he had taken a bunch of pills that night. 
Mm -hmm. and was as he was going down the stairs that's what happened that's where the blood came from so then they started separating everybody interviewing and then they knew Ivan was gone they had him taken out of there and then they had to process the room yeah yeah Fast forward to February 13th of 2020, I was at work and I seen an email come across from the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office. Mm -hmm. And so I knew what it was. So I I just kept thinking, okay, I'll look at it tonight. Well, that lasted all of three minutes. Yeah, you can. So I went over to my boss and I said, um, I said, I just got an email and he was very um, understanding, great boss, helped me throughout this. So I started home and I got a phone call from my daughter, who again is two hours south in Tucson. And I need to back up for just a second. At the very first, when I said that um, we were all finding out his dad and all of us, actually the one that found out first was my daughter. It was all alone down in Tucson because when the paramedics got to the fraternity house and all of it was going on, they were, you know, there's, they're on Greek row. So there's sororities and fraternities everywhere. And finally, when it got out who it was, somebody had texted my daughter and said, I'm so sorry on the loss of your brother. And she was like, what are you talking about? Oh my word. And so they, they said, no, he was a great guy. And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. So they went back and forth a little bit. And she said, you're freaking me out. So here's the number to my dad and my mom. Call them. Yeah. So that's how my daughter found out. Well, back to the medical examiner. I'm driving home and my daughter calls me and she says, mom, why do I have a message from somebody at the news and why are all my friends telling me how Ivan died? And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, they're saying that it's on the news that he died of fentanyl. And I said, what? I said, I just got the email not 20 minutes ago. And I said, I said, let me figure this out. So I immediately called the chief of police who I had been speaking to at ASU, he had been my contact and the one that I had been asking all the questions to. So I called him and I said, what is going on here? How do they know? And he said, well, there's the freedom of information act. Mm -hmm. And when this all happened, probably the news outlets put in their request for the freedom of information act. And when the Emmy's office released this to you, it doesn't go in any sort of order. They release it to all. Oh my God. I said, so I don't even get the courtesy of being able to process it and tell my children. And he said, well, that's the Freedom of Information Act. I'm so sorry. Well, you still would have thought that somebody would have had the courtesy to pick up the phone and tell you instead of just sending you an email. You would have right? thought. I mean, that's I, horrible. And that's, that's how I thought it would go down. I got home and read over the Emmys report and it just, it's still kind of a blur. And I just remember looking at the toxicology, but I do remember the Emmys report saying that cause of death was mixed drug intoxication, mm-hmm. which was fentanyl and a tizolam. I knew kind of what fentanyl was. Obviously, in looking it up, thinking that that, you know, during this whole waiting time, trying to do a little bit of research on it, I had no idea what a tizolam was. And it's apparently a synthetic form of Xanax that's illegal everywhere except for China. China makes it, again, as a synthetic form of Xanax. And many times it's more potent than the actual Xanax. Mm -hmm. So then after reading through all that, I had so many questions. Okay. He had this many nanograms of fentanyl. Like, what does that mean? Did it like barely kill him? You know, I I don't understand. So I made all these questions, went through the victim's advocate. She presented the questions to the pathologist and 
I told them, I said, please do not sugarcoat anything. Yeah. Um, again, nothing can hurt me more. I want to know very directly. And one of the questions I asked him, I said, he had however many nanograms of fentanyl. I said, like, what does this mean? He said he had enough fentanyl in his system through the one pill to cause death to 11 men. Wow. And I said, I've kind of looked up what atizolam is. Can you expand? And so he kind of expanded into the synthetic. I said, if it was just the fentanyl, it obviously would have killed him. And he said, yes. He said, but mixed with the atizolam, it was a certain death. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I guess the the biggest thing that I wanted to know, I just wanted to know, did he did he know he was dying? Was he aware? And he said, probably not. Yeah. He said it actually was probably a very peaceful death because how it suppresses the respiratory system. Yeah. 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 He wouldn't have been fighting to breathe. He just would have stopped. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then later the police finally sent me all of Ivan's belongings. And so one of the first things I wanted to do was go through his phone, which I did. And I found the whole text stream of buying the pill. Um, He had a contact. Apparently it was a well-known contact of all of the kind of fraternity brothers. He was kind of the contact for all of them. He was a fellow fraternity brother. Mm Mm-hmm. And in putting everything together, since he started contacting this kid, essentially, on the evening of November 10th, Mm -hmm. because he wanted to just relax and sleep in on the 11th, again, being Veterans Day and not having any classes. Mm -hmm. He wanted to buy two Xanax so that he could relax and go to sleep. So it went through the whole thing where they went and met And this other kid that was with him, the George kid, bought a large amount of pills Mm -hmm. of Xanax. And I even bought two. Or what they thought was Xanax, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He bought the two and only ended up taking the one because the other one was found at the scene. It was the same exact size as as Xanax pill. It was stamped exactly the way. A Xanax pill, it mimicked it exactly. So he just and had that's no idea. why once mm-hmm. when they were doing the investigation that this got turned over to the DEA because the DEA interviewed the kid for quite some time. And that again supposedly is why I couldn't get answers because it was with the DEA right after it came out. So again, it was it was all over local news when it happened here. Five or six different news stations. It came up when it first initially happened, but now it was resurfacing sure. because there was the Emmy report came out. So I knew it was resurfacing. So then, of course, all of the comments to the news stories yeah. of another college kid being reckless, taking drugs, yeah. all this and. That was not him. I mean, I'm going to say nobody forced him to take the pill. Sure. By all accounts, he was not an addict. I think it was like a recreational thing that mm-hmm. all of them participated in. So not only were the comments just, you so know, horrible. horrific, and I had to stop looking at them, as you unfortunately well know. Mm-hmm. The most hurtful one that came out, news story, was when... The ASU police allowed their spokesperson to come out and give in detail how he was found, what the scene looked like, everything that I had been asking and begging from the beginning. Yeah. Who found him, how he looked, that he was face down. When they rolled him over, he had his cell phone on him. He was in boxers and socks. Just everything everything. And I was so mad because how dare they take this great son of mine and reduce him to that? And how dare they like tell the whole world? Basically, you found out with the world on the news instead of in a private way 
that you can mourn him yourself with your family. You, you never got the honor to be able to do that. I mean, to just have to mourn su- in such a public way. Oh, it's just, uh, I mean, when you wrote to me initially, I just couldn't even fathom that. I felt like I got a little bit of local stuff, but at least I felt like I knew things ahead of time and before other people for sure. Right. And then this was national. This is like everybody and everybody judging and thinking they knew what kind of kid Ivan was. Mm-hmm. When the, I mean, honestly, I know it's not drug use is not wise. It's it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible decision to make. But honestly, this was a kid who just wanted to sleep in. Right? That's that's truly what it came down to. And I think at the time he had like a 3.45 and he was a junior. I mean, he, yeah. by all accounts and kind of pointing to that, he was not, you know, strung out on drugs. It was a, a bad mistake, one bad mistake. I mean, if pills were hugely prevalent when I was going to college, it could have been me. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was more, I guess, alcohol really when I was going to college and, and that was the other thing that I struggled with too, is he was not only academically smart, but I think he resonated with so many people because he was common sense smart. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had people tell me, well, that's why you don't take pills from people you don't know. Yeah. And I said, well. And this is the thing though. He felt like he did know him, right? He did. He, he, he was, was a, a fraternity, fraternity brother. brother. He seemed like a known reliable source not that it was a smart choice it wasn't we know that we that's a given but it wasn't like he was taking something from a stranger he was taking something from somebody that he knew he thought he knew what he was taking he thought it was just gonna make him sleep in and that's that's the hard thing I mean it's kind of like we were talking before it's so easy to victim blame Mm -hmm, for sure and that's where I really kind of started getting angry, especially reading all the news stories saying overdose, overdose. And I kept kind of putting in my mind, I'm just like, he didn't overdose. It was drug induced homicide. If it was, if it was anything, luckily I kind of started stumbling on some groups and some other things that helped me put it into perspective that it is fentanyl poisoning. Yeah. It is poisoning. It is murder. And that is something that is laced in so many drugs now. Yes. I mean, you are not the first mom that I've interviewed whose child died because the drug they th- they thought they were taking was laced with fentanyl, unbeknownst to them. It's horrible. It's a horrible tragedy. And ah. that was kind of the other the other couple questions I had. One of the questions I had is, Okay, number one, why was so much light shed on him and his death and all that? And somebody explained it to me and kind of put it into perspective. They said, well, number one, it happened on a college campus, a very well-known college campus, which is the first part of the trifecta as great news. Yeah. And number two, it was in a fraternity. So that was the second part. And number three, they said he was a good looking kid. So they said there's your trifecta. Good looking kids with grades. great grades and a flowery looking future ahead of him. All of that. Right. That yes. was, you're right. To think of, you know, how it all went down. And again, looking at text messages in his phone, I could see there were a couple other times previously that he had bought a pill or two from this same kid. Mm -hmm. So again, I knew, you know, he thought he was a trusted source, but I just kind of go to the thing of, if I'm going to offer you, let's say a piece of cheese, then you're going to take that at face value and it's going to be a piece of cheese. And if you die from it, because I laced it with fentanyl, you were poisoned. Mm -hmm. It's no different than this did the guy know that he was giving him something other than xanax do you know i truly believe he didn't yeah my kind of layman 
investigation that I did with all this once I got his phone is the kid was a very quiet kid, apparently, Mm -hmm. um, very unassuming. He was very into video games and computers. Mm -hmm. I think, again, there's no evidence to follow this up, but in my mom opinion, I think he went on to the dark web Mm -hmm. and bought quite a few Mm -hmm. possibly from China and got them sent to him. And that was kind of his supply that he sold. Yeah. Um, According to the DA, because I have spoken with the DA, Ivan is the first case in Arizona to have died from that particular mixed drug combination Mm -hmm. with the atizolam. So I'm assuming that George took the same thing and didn't die or what happened with George? Do you know? (laughs) I think he took the same thing. I think his tolerance was, was much higher. higher. Yeah. And yeah. he was a much, much bigger kid mm-hmm. because George had dropped out of school months before. And that was kind of his. Yeah. Routine. So he probably did have a pretty high tolerance. Although, obviously, it was very, very messed up to be still incoherent at two o'clock the next afternoon. So Very messed up. I truly believe that this kid didn't know what he was selling. Mm-hmm. And that is part of the issue that we're having, meaning when I speak to the DA as far as pressing charges, Mm -hmm. is how the law is written. It is written to distribute with intent to harm. Yeah. The intent part is what is hanging it up. Mm -hmm. I put some effort into it, you know, obviously in speaking to the DA and trying to go forward, but it was almost, it was like, I felt like it was taking away from my, I was putting more effort in that and not as much into grieving and I, and honoring him Mm -hmm. as I should. I don't even know if that makes sense. I think it makes perfect sense. I a hundred percent understand that. So have you been pushing for the DA to do things or have you not then? I pushed about... Four months ago was my big push with them. Mm -hmm. I kept going back and forth with them. They did meet with me one day. I took Ivan down. I have his ashes, so I took him with me. Mm -hmm. I took his picture, and I sat down with him, and I said, here's what's left of my son. Yeah. He's sitting right here with us. This is what I have left. He said, I understand that it's hard for you to go forth with the way the law is written. Yeah. And the big thing at the time was he was the first fentanyl death at ASU. Mm -hmm. Well, two months later, there was another fentanyl death of a freshman where they got their pills, I think was unrelated. So they kind of explained to me, you know, the with intent and then actually bringing George into it was going to be very hard because George's credibility was not there. Mm -hmm. because of other things and I just kept feeling if I kept focusing on that yeah it was like a dead end frustrating thing and it was Mm -hmm. taking away from me honoring yeah Ivan's memory Mm -hmm. and knowing him the way he was in a way he almost wouldn't want me to blame the kid that gave it to him Mm -hmm. and I, I know that's kind of an odd way of looking at it but it's just how I feel. I totally understand. I totally agree. Because for a long time, I was super angry with the woman who hit us, right? I mean, what was she doing? What was she thinking? Why did she do that? I'll never know what happened. I'll never know what she was thinking or what she was doing or why it did happen. But at some point in time for me, I had to forgive her and I had to let go of that because that was the only way for me to move on and heal and for me to really, truly grieve Andy, while all the court stuff was ongoing, I never really got better. I didn't until I let go of the anger part. Mm-hmm. When I let go of the anger part, suddenly I was able to start to heal and start to move forward. The anger was paralyzing to me. And it sounds like the anger did that to you a little bit, that you felt like you couldn't really move on until you realized, I, I just can't be angry with this kid who did something that was stupid for sure but he didn't mean to hurt him and yeah and as long as you just still are stuck with that anger it just keeps you stuck in parts of your grief journey too 
Yeah, and I, I think that's what it was. And I didn't, you know, I, I don't want to by any means say that I came to some great revelation because that's what it it was. It was almost maybe subconsciously Mm -hmm. that I knew this, or maybe it was even like Ivan guiding me because I was in Arkansas, even after the funeral, I went back to Arkansas and I did not move back to Phoenix until August Mm -hmm. of last year. Once I got here, it was very good to be here because I was glad to be back because then I was closer to the other two But there was also this anger and vengeful side of me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, okay, I'm closer to the other two that I feel did him wrong. The one that sold him Mm -hmm. and the George kid. And I actually blame the George kid more because in looking at the texts, he encouraged him that night because George wanted to come over. George said, let's get some pills, all of this. Yeah. And I also think you were in a bed six feet away from him and you let him die Yeah. and you participated in this. And so there were times, you know, I would be like, okay, well, I'm going to find out where this kid lives or where this kid works Mm -hmm. and not do anything like physical, but almost like taunt them. And then I started, you know, I guess (laughs) coming to my senses and being like, okay, you're really letting the anger take over. Mm -hmm. If I did that, how would that be honoring Ivan? Mm -hmm. Ivan would be mortified by that. Mm -hmm. Never was that part of Ivan or Ivan's spirit. And as bad as I wanted to for his revenge and Mm -hmm. his- It's the mama bear coming out in you, right? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I found out too. Like I found out who the woman was. I did that all through crazy ways too. You know, I saw the car, I saw the license plate. I looked up the license plate. I figured out who she was. I Facebook book stalked her. My best friend drove past her house. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you do when you get really angry. Uh, But then I lost part of me when I was that angry. I'm not this person who stalks people and drives past their house and looks to see if they posted to Facebook and all of this kind of stuff. That is not me. I needed to get a little bit. I mean, I'm never going to get back to who I used to be, but I can get closer. And I certainly didn't like who I was at that point in time. Not at all. Well, I'm certainly glad that I'm not the only one (laughs) that thinks this way. Because like I said, I, you know, same stuff. Mm -hmm. But then exactly like you said, I I was losing me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I still have Gabby and Sam that I kind of have to be a little bit of a role model to, you know, I also thought about that. I was like, well, if I do something real crazy, then that's just going to hurt them even worse. I mean, they've already lost a brother. Like yeah. they can't have their mom going crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be vengeful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I guess the, the main thing that I come to is just, I feel like it's now my obligation to number one, try to move on and be as happy as I possibly can mm-hmm. to him and live life the way he did. He lived a quality life in his 20 short years and also have it known that instances like his are not an overdose. Just like Dr. Laura Berman, who unfortunately happened to her son a couple months ago, it is not a overdose. It is a poisoning. It it, it is murder and our kids are being murdered because of this. Yeah. And I really am glad you said that and talking about this as a poisoning and not an overdose because that is absolutely correct he was poisoned with something that he didn't realize he was taking and yeah to classify everything all the same and talk about it all as an overdose is just not truthful and reduces I think him too in some ways it's nice to be able to tell individual stories right people have individual stories 
And that's why I love doing something like this and talking to different people and hearing their stories and hearing about who Ivan was. That's, that's a beautiful thing. Right now, you know, this went nationwide, this story. And Ivan was just considered just a college kid who overdosed and was maybe an addict or something like that. I mean, that's right. what, that's what's out there. And I love what you want to do is to talk about, no, that's not who he was. That's not who he was. And not, that's not who these kids are that are dying from fentanyl. This is not the whole story. And we need to tell people the whole story and so they can understand better and not victim blame, as you said. Exactly. And to also know if it can be Ivan, it literally could be any kid. Yeah. Because I had so many parents, especially the parents that he went to high school with, who are doctors and surgeons and lawyers and all of this. It can happen to your kid. It can happen to any kid. I, I never thought it would happen to Ivan. Oh, heck no. He's too smart. He has probably more common sense than most adults. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, that's a great lesson for all of us. Well, thank you so much, Velvet, for sharing with Ivan with us today. I really appreciate it and learned a lot. Oh, uh, well, thank you again for letting me share him and, and being so understanding about mm -hmm. it. Mm, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. We are always looking for new show ideas. If you'd like to be a guest, know someone who'd be a great guest, or have a show idea, please email us at marcy at andysmom.com. Be sure to visit the webpage, andysmom.com, for more content, including Marcy's blog. There you can also sign up to receive updates via email. Together, let's work to inspire hope, one day at a time.